Greetings and welcome to the second week of this MOOC Introduction to Biorisk Management. In this week, I will be discussing the concept of risk assessment. We will be discussing the various terminologies associated with risk assessment such as accident, incident, as well as specific terminologies such as adequacy and the importance of microbial risk assessment. Welcome back to the second week of this MOOC introduction to biorisk management. I hope you have been making good progress. As this MOOC progresses, we continuously improve the quality of the content based on your comments and suggestions. I look forward to receiving these comments and suggestions in the forums. Today's lecture will focus on a risk assessment. I will introduce you to the concepts of hazards and risks and this will then progress on to the next lecture module which will focus on risk mitigation. Now as a biorisk manager you must be aware of the multiple risks which are present in a laboratory setting. These extend beyond biological risks and these hazards can compromise your laboratory work as well as your safety. As a competent biorisk manager, you must assess the risk associated with the hazards with the primary objective of minimizing the likelihood of a breach of containment. In this module, I will introduce you to the concepts of hazards and risks. I want you to understand how a process involving a biological agent, a laboratory process to be specific, increases the likelihood and consequence of a particular event. And that event focuses on the breach of containment and the subsequent exposure of the laboratory personnel and the community to the biological agent. I will introduce you to the process of hazard identification and risk assessment and introduce you to specific terms such as residual risk, accident and incident. Each of these terms has a very specific definition. These are your learning outcomes. You should be able to define and describe the terms hazard and risk, describe how laboratory processes increase the level of risk, perform a hazard identification and risk assessment, and define the terms residual risk, accident, and incident. Now, in this lecture module, I have introduced you to the process via a case study. We will undertake a process, a very simple process, before we move on to more complex case studies in the next lecture. The first term which you must understand is the term incident. An incident is an event. Both accidents and incidents are events. They occur within a spatial and temporal framework. However, an incident has a potential to cause harm, but it does not necessarily cause harm. This can be in the case of a near miss, for instance, you are working in the laboratory with a beaker full of sulfuric acid and you spill the acid, but just in time to avoid the spill. So you spill the acid, but you step back immediately and the acid falls on the floor. Now, this is an example of an incident. It has not caused an accident, but it has the potential for causing harm in the form of a burn injury. An accident is an unintended event giving rise to harm. Now, for example, in, you have the same case. You have sulfuric acid on the table. You spill it and then you have a burn injury on your skin. That constitutes an accident. There was no intention to spill the acid on your skin. However, it occurred, so it's unintended. We now move on to the definition of hazard and a hazard is a source, situation or act 
with the potential for causing harm. A very uh, common example is your vehicle itself. You are in your vehicle, your car or your truck and you are parked in your garage. The, the truck itself is not a hazard, but when you begin to move this truck across the parking lot into the main street and onto the highway, the hazard is manifest due to a process. And these are some of the hazards in the laboratory. You have theft, you can have fire hazards, radio, radioactive hazard, ergonomic hazards, slipping, as well as the radioactive and biological hazards and electrical hazards. These are the hazards which you encounter in a standard laboratory. Now we move on to the concept of risk. Risk is the combination of the probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. I will define and describe this in detail with an example. The okay, risk focuses on probability and severity. Probability implies likelihood. What is the likelihood of the event and severity uh, is focused on the possible consequences of that event. For instance, if you are working with a biological agent, what is the likelihood of that biological agent causing harm to the laboratory workers or the community? Obviously, it will be higher in the case of the laboratory environment where you work within a confined space. However, the consequences will be similar to the public as well as to the laboratory workers. If the biological agent were to be released into a public space, it would cause harm to the community, which is equivalent to the harm that would be caused in a laboratory working environment. So the consequences may be similar, but the likelihood changes based on the process. Let us delve into this with an example. Biorisk is the combination of the probability of the occurrence of the harm and the severity of that harm where the source of harm is a biological agent or toxin. So this redefines the risk factor in terms of the bio risk. Now hazards evolve into risks. As I mentioned to you in the example of the vehicle, your vehicle parked in your parking lot or in your garage does not pose a risk, but the very fact that you move the vehicle from the parking lot into an unsafe environment, which is the highway or the freeway, increases the level of risk or it, the hazard evolves into a risk. Now in the laboratory setting, laboratory procedures, shipping of biological agents, theft, and breach of containment all are risks which are posed by the hazard that is essentially the biological agent in itself. If you have developed this analogy or this example for you, let us assume that we isolated a microbe from the soil, but we don't know what the identity is. We culture the microbe in the lab and then we move on to the introduction of new genes. We introduce new genes into this microbe and we increase the culture volume in the fermenter. So from a small petri plate, which is about 20 cc of media, we move on to a 25 liter fermenter with liquid culture. So now we have up the volume or increase the volume. Then we inject this microbe into mice to check whether it's pathogenic or non-pathogenic. This is a laboratory test or laboratory procedure. And now there is a potential for transmission from the mice into the laboratory workers. So as you can see, a process, a simple process of increasing the culture volume and then infecting another host has increased the risk of accidental release of this particular biological agent. You may also want to look at another risk from the biosafety and biosecurity perspective, which is the risk of theft of this particular sample and the risk of release of the data pertaining to infection of 
human host via the animal host. Now this can pose a potential biosecurity risk as the information about transmission from the animal to the human host can be misused with a nefarious or bad intent. Okay, and with the risk of accidental release, you have also the risk of the consequences increase as the experiment progresses. As a bio-risk manager, we focus on the hazard identification. Then we conduct a risk assessment, risk control, and we assess the residual risk before we make a decision whether we want to proceed with that experiment or not. So hazard identification involves identification of the hazards in the laboratory. In our case, as bio-risk managers, we focus on the potential biological hazards. We then conduct a risk assessment which I will demonstrate to you via a case study. And then we focus on risk control or what is termed as risk mitigation. This will be the subject of our next lecture in which we focus on risk control. And finally, we identify residual risk where we determine residual risk and then make decisions regarding the process. So if the residual risk is too high, a laboratory by risk manager may advise the management Please do not work with this particular biological agent because the facilities are not adequate. Now the process of recognizing that a hazard exists and defining its characteristics is termed as hazard identification. So hazard identification basically focuses on identifying or categorizing a biological agent into its respective risk group. And this constitutes the process of defining its characteristics. So in order to identify a hazard, you need a prior information or prior information pertaining to that particular biological agent. And this can be found in the pathogen safety data sheets, which I will share with you via a link. So the pathogen safety data sheets do not constitute a written document. It's a website which is being designed and developed by the government of Canada. And it's a very useful website for bio-risk managers. We now move on to bio-risk management. So bio-risk management focuses on the process of evaluating the bio-risks and taking into account the adequacy of any existing controls and deciding whether or not the bio-risk is acceptable. So these are multiple steps. You first evaluate the bio-risk. You take into account the adequacy of any existing controls which may be present at your facility. And then you decide whether the bio-risk is acceptable or not. Bio-risk controls focuses on actions implementing bio-risk management decisions. And we will focus on this on, in a specific lecture on controls. These are the five controls. They are elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. I have just touched upon these briefly to give you a mental note of what we will be discussing in the next lecture. So all of these controls and their application will be discussed in the next lecture. Upon completion of the risk assessment, we work with what is known as residual risk. A bio-risk manager cannot eliminate risk completely as risk involves working with specific biological agents. So we have to decide whether we want to proceed with the experiment or whether we want to inform the management that the risk is too high and terminate the experimental procedure or the laboratory process. I will briefly delve into concepts via a very simple case study before I move on to more complex case studies during this MOOC. But let us look at a very simple case study 
just to introduce you to okay i have set up an example we that is all of us are a team of bi risk managers so we have a collective responsibility and we also have a bi safety officer amongst us and our task is to develop a laboratory management system for working with a known infectious biological agent for which the following information is currently available now i have used the word information and currently available in the case of biological agents and evolving situations you must always refer to the current information available at the pathogen safety data sheet website or psds website as the information evolves with increasing amounts of available data this is the information which is avail available to us in our particular case study the microorganism or the causative agent is a virus the risk group is risk group 4 refer to who risk groups the mode of transmission is via aerosol the portal of entry is through your nasal passage as well as through the ocular route through your eyes and there is no vaccine available so this this is the information which is available to us so based on this information we can conduct our risk assessment we will delve into a thorough risk assessment in another case study now this is the process which occurs at your facility so this is the biological agent it is shipped to your facility okay so you have a transport security here then it is dispensed into tubes so we open up the packaging and we dispense it into tubes and then we store it in a refrigerator so i have indicated this as a safe because this is secure refrigerator then it moves on to process so the laboratory technicians so the researchers begin processing the sample over here and finally they transfer the data into the cloud via a secure computer or secure internet connection and this process generates waste so this is the process which you must define as a bi risk manager you must break down a process into its constituent parts and approach each process separately during risk assessment this is a verbose definition of the processes i have delineated the processes so the biological agent is shipped the sample is received the sample is stored extraction is done and processing of the rna and finally the sample is disposed and concurrently documentation and transfer to the hospital the data is transferred back to the hospital the first step as a bi risk manager is to look at adequacy now suppose i receive that sample in a lab in which i do not have what i mentioned earlier a biological safety cabinet i basically cannot work with that sample because when i open the sample and i process it there will be the generation of aerosols so in this case the case of adequacy must be addressed we now move on to other aspects so we look at facilities are our facilities adequate do we have the appropriate instrumentation are our personnel competent do they need additional training do we have the sops and the means for disposal of biological waste or hazardous waste and do we have contingency planning in the event of a breach of containment these are factors which must be looked into in detail when you conduct your risk assessment so we look at our existing controls as the first step of risk assessment we then move on to specific questions so risks we are attempting to assess so the first risk may be bio safety associated so risk of exposure of the laboratory personnel to the biological agent so this concerns personnel second risk risk of exposure of the community to the biological agent as i mentioned earlier you may recall the concept of primary and secondary containment so 
in the first case is our primary containment adequate in the second case is our secondary containment adequate we may also want to look at the biosecurity risk risk of intentional release of the biological agent so someone may decide to steal that biological asset and use it for their own intent, intended purpose which may be nefarious with the intent to cause harm so let's look back at our example or case study and risk assessment is a step by step process we conduct risk assessment at each step so the first step is here transport storage and then we receipt of the sample and storage and processing of the sample and waste management so the risk of release of the biological agent and risk of exposure of the personnel as well as the community to the biological agent must be addressed at each stage or each step of the process this is a risk matrix i have developed this risk matrix for you to be used throughout the moc you may refer to other risk matrix which are available online but we look at risk of exposure of laboratory personnel to the biological agent during processing of the sample you must define all these parameters so risk of exposure of the laboratory personnel to the biological agent during and we look at the consequence and, and the likelihood so if the consequence is low we indicate a low risk if it is very high we have a scale and the likelihood is on this scale so this is low moderate high very high so we have clearly indicated the scale for instance the risk of exposure of laboratory personnel to the biological agent during for instance extraction of rna the risk of exposure will be very high and the consequences will be moderate because rna is not infectious however if the same laboratory worker was involved in culture of the live virus in a liquid medium the consequence will be very high and the likelihood of that sample getting uh, released or spilled accidentally also is very high so this is a risk matrix which we will delve into during the course of this case study we also have to look at the overall risk matrix now in the overall risk matrix we look at the process which are shipping receipt of the sample storage processing disposal and data transfer and we look at the overall risk so this indicates low high and moderate i have indicated this in various colors for your reference and for the overall risk matrix we look at the risk of exposure of the community to the biological agent and the risk of the theft of the sample or the intentional release in terms of the biosecurity aspect so there's a high risk during shipping and a high risk during receipt and storage it drops and during processing of the sample disposal and data transfer the risk is very low so the risk level drops as the sample is processed as the sample gets inactivated the thief can no longer use it for intended harm or intentional release as it is no longer biologically active at this point we have to make a decision and the questions which a bio risk manager looks at are what is the residual risk are our facilities adequate do we need additional training and we then move on to the next step which is risk mitigation so for risk mitigation as i mentioned earlier we'll focus on the mitigation of risk via the application of five controls to summarize in this lecture we have focused on the hazard and not only biological hazards but also other laboratory hazards such as electrical chemical 
radiological and ergonomic hazards. We have focused on the concept of risk and defined risk in terms of risk itself as well as bio risk. We have conducted a basic risk assessment using a risk matrix in a step by step manner. We have understood the concept of residual risk and we have reinforced all these concepts via a case study. We have also learned about the risk matrix and how it can be utilized to identify risks associated with specific biological or laboratory processes. That brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you have understood the key concepts. If you need more clarification pertaining to any of these concepts, please post a remark in the forum or comment in the forum. I welcome your critical comments and suggestions and I will constantly try to improve upon this MOOC as it progresses. Thank you for your support and your feedback. Thank you and stay bio safe.